available. And speaking here today with us is uh, Desiree Morningstar of the Technical Services Section Chief um, out of the St. Paul District. Um, so we want to welcome you guys here. And also uh, Leslie Day, who's the Mitigation Coordinator out of St. Paul District as well. Um, we're here to speak about the, uh, the mitigation um, aspect of the uh, presentation. So thank you Thanks. both for coming. Thanks. And I, I do just want to take the blame for being late um, until 2.15 this afternoon. We thought we were supposed to be here at 2.30 tomorrow. So I don't know how we got our wires crossed, but um, at 2.15 we realized we needed to be here today at 2.30. So <laughs> we're testing our impromptu speaking skills. <laughs> Good stuff. I think Leslie and I, like you guys, probably wait until night four to practice your presentation for the next day. So we didn't do that last night. <laughs> so we are going to do our best. Um, and I do want to say, um, also before we get started, specific to our street procedures, a lot of you probably saw our announcement. We are recruiting for our senior ecologist. Um, probably everybody in the room knew Barbara Walther, who retired last fall. Um, and we are actively recruiting now for um, a backfill for her position. So I know there may be a number of you who are qualified and interested. So um, if you haven't already seen that announcement on USA Jobs and you're interested, um, it is open to external candidates. Um, probably all of you know we have a, um, a pretty well-rounded um, wetland program, and we are really just now getting into streams. So you know, in addition to looking for somebody with wetland expertise, we are, are looking for someone who also has stream experience, um, you know, whether that's educational and or practical, you know, somebody who really has interest and enthusiasm for delineation of streams, understanding of functions, understanding of impacts and compensation. So if you have any questions about that recruitment, please talk to me afterwards or you can email or call me. Um, so procedures um, in stream compensation, just talking about that generally. Why are we talking about that? Um, you guys know, I'm not going to reiterate to you the mission of our Clean Water Act, but you know we're responsible for uh, implementing Section 404 of the Clean Water Act and um, successfully ensuring the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of waters is protected. So that includes you know, not just public waters, not just wetlands, but all waters that are regulated under the Clean Water Act. Uh, mitigation to offset unavoidable environmental losses is a requirement under the mitigation rule. Um, you guys are probably very familiar with that 2008 mitigation rule in the context of thinking about it for wetland compensation. Um, so, so we're taking those same requirements, same concepts, and applying them now um, to, uh, holistically to tributary impacts. Can, can everybody hear me without the microphone? Not well. Okay, so you need that. And for the, the video too, guys. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay, so why now? Um, can you hear me now? Is that better? It's on. Is this better? No, doesn't. Doesn't sound any different to me. No. Okay. I don't, if you like to go without it, you're welcome. Okay, I will just try to talk louder. Um, so why now? Um, why are we? Um, why are we taking what appears to be a shift in perspective on stream impacts? Um, well, we do have a functional assessment tool available now in our district. Um, the development of this tool was led by EPA um, with funding through a grant um, and led by the um, stream consulting firm, Stream Dynamics. Um, we do have a greater body of knowledge on stream impacts and an understanding of the importance of streams and watersheds and the need <coughs> to offset impacts that cannot be avoided. Um, and we, we also have requests for a more transparent review of projects with stream impacts. You know, over the course of time, we have required compensation for larger projects, um, and, and we need to be consistent in, in the types of requirements that we are um, presenting to applicants. So phased implementation. Now, if you get nothing else from my presentation today, you know, I want you to really um, take home the message that we do have a tool available to assess functional conditions, functional loss, and functional gains. Um, we do have requirements consistent with the rule um, to require stream mitigation. Um, because we are still very early in this process, we are still developing our procedures to implement the tools. I um, mean, you know, we are really um, taking a phased approach 
and, and going to be working slowly over time to um, improve our, our compensation um, requirements based on what we learn from impacts and restoration proposals. Can I ask a quick question? So is the core going to necessitate that we use that tool? So that is something that we are going to address in the procedures. Right now, what we are, what we are and this will be addressed in a further slide, uh, the use of the tool will be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. You know, for, for larger projects, it will be more obvious from the beginning and sure. based on the, the severity of the proposed impacts. But the, the scale of the impacts, the severity of the impacts will dictate the use. Okay, thank you. Um, so why haven't we finished our procedures document yet? You know, we've got the tool available, it's out there, you can find it on our website. Um, the procedures to describing how we'll use it aren't quite ready because we're working to answer questions that we think are really important, um, that provide information um, to the public and to <coughs> stakeholders about what to expect through use of the tool. And I'll, I'll go over some of the questions that we're working to answer. Um, we are engaging with applicants, asking questions about streams, and, you know, the basic question of what streams do you have in your project area. Um, we're working on tools to help identify streams like ordinary high watermark forms that, that give you information on characteristics of streams and you know, allow you to collect information that helps defend where the line on the map is um, with respect to tributaries within the project area. Um, we'll be asking more questions about measures to avoid and minimize effects to streams. You know, you guys are used to questions like that with respect to wetlands, and we'll be asking those same questions now in terms of ability to achieve project purpose while avoiding. If effects cannot be avoided, then working with you on minimization measures and then going to that third step of compensation. Um, one big thing, this is a really important point, we are working with applicants to understand the extent of effect on functions from activities. So um, a really fundamental part of the tool is uh, severity tiers. So there are five total um, severity tiers that, depending on where your activity falls in those tiers, will influence the amount of a functional deficit as a result of your project. So if you have an activity that is not very impactful to important functions, you'll be in a much lower category, you know, category one versus category five, or those kinds of activities that completely obliterate the stream. So and there's lots of things like culverts that could fall into you know, the second, third, or fourth category, depending on the extent of the effects on different functions from those activities. So you know, we know we're not the experts in understanding comprehensively the nature of effects from all activities on all functions so you know we want to make sure that we're working with you collecting information from you to understand the extent of effects on those functions from the activities that you're proposing um, the level of detail required about conditions of impact sites will reflect scale and intensity of impact so this gets to the question from the gentleman in the back um, if it's a relatively small impact, about 300 feet is what we're thinking right now, and that's still a proposal, 300 feet or less, we likely wouldn't require detailed information. 300 feet or more, you know, that's a suggested threshold right now, is when we're going to start thinking about re requesting and requiring that more detailed functional assessment. So if you have a project that has impacts to a stream, what do you do? Um, you know, the first thing, and it's probably even a precursor to this list of questions is, you know, if you have a, a, a tributary on site, um, or if you have a feature on site that is, is a tributary that conveys water, um, you know, you want to, to work potentially with us to under, understand, is this a tributary subject to clean water jurisdiction? <coughs> So these procedures that we're working on developing do not change jurisdiction. Um, you all are probably aware that the Clean Water Rule has been rescinded, and now with respect to jurisdiction, the Rapanos um, guide, the 86 regs with Rapanos guidance is, is now back in place um, with respect to establishing jurisdiction. So these procedures in no way affect what is jurisdictional, but if something is jurisdictional, then these procedures would come into play. And, and we would work with you to understand effects and talk about um, minimization of those effects. So, 
So some information, once you know you've got a tributary on site that's subject to, to regulation and to permitting, um, working with us um, and providing information on these things listed here. Project purpose, what activities, how could this affect stream function, um, you know, uh, qualitatively providing us information on effects from the activities on stream function, and then also potentially providing to us some of that quantitative information as a result of using this DSUT. Yes? Uh, yeah, Desiree, I have a question. Does this uh, pertain to, um, you know, work in the immediate adjacent, like upland riparian zone, or is it just like within or below the OHW? So for, for it, it relates to regulated impacts and tributaries. So if the riparian area is all upland, then those activities would not be regulated. If there are wetlands in that riparian area, then your activities could be regulated. Um, so like tree clearing and that kind of thing. Right, no, right. In that riparian yes, so. if you're tree clearing in uplands, or doing tree clearing in wetlands in a way that doesn't cause discharge of fill, then that's not regulated. Um, you know, in, in terms of the importance of the riparian corridor to the function of the stream, you know, that is taken into account in the SQT. Because there is, you know, there are things about the riparian corridor and the, the characteristics of that corridor that may enhance or degrade the function of the stream. Uh, so ongoing procedures, development, um, some tasks, some questions that we're working on answering, um, some things that we want to be clear about, uh, you know, provide as much um, concise direction as possible. Um, we've, there's, I think, Every version 1.0 is followed by version 1.1 or 2.0, and so I mean we don't expect to get this first version you know right <coughs> on all points, and we know it will evolve and improve over time. But we do want to be as clear as we can on questions that we know will be of central importance to understanding. Um, so here are some things that we're working on. I'm not going to read all of those separately. Leslie's going to talk about the SQT and the data tool and kind of more of the technical stuff. I'm just doing the kind of the policy procedure aspect, so we want to have time for her to talk to. Um, but, you know, this is a number of things that we're working on. You know, things like you know, halfway down through the list, one that we want to be really clear about: when you have a stream compensation project and there are wetlands also in that riparian corridor, you know, how how is the crediting approached? You know, is it, can we allow for stream credits and wetland credits? Or if the, the, the wetland is in that riparian zone that is essential to the to the stream function, is it stream function or is it stream credits only? So those kinds of questions are what we want to make sure we're really really clear about answers and direction. Um, we develop a site selection checklist um, for stream banks. Um, we know there is a lot of interest now that you know, an, an emerging market is developing um, for stream banks. Um, we expect, because we do get a lot of bank proposals in the context of wetlands, we're, we expect and hope to see a lot of stream bank proposals. Um, and we want to provide as much certainty as we can up front on fatal flaws, red flags, you know, things that, you know, if, if these fatal flaws are present, you know, it's probably not going to be a good proposal, but if you don't have any of those fatal flaws, you know, let's talk. Because the, the, the watersheds need stream banks, and we're going to need them, applicants are going to need them to offset unavoidable stream impacts. So when will mitigation be required? Um, this again, I've already alluded to this, and this is something that we're you know, talking about, and it will be in the procedures. You know, very likely anything in excess of 300 feet is going to be um, use of the debit tool, um, permanent loss in excess of 1,000 feet, um, you know, that's, that's almost always going to be a trigger for use of the data tool. Uh, permanent loss, I'm not going to read this to you because you guys probably are very familiar with this, but just a reminder of what we mean by permanent loss. Um, you know, that's any, any loss of bed um, related to filling or excavation in connection to a regulated activity. Um, so this, when do you start, Leslie? I've got a few more. Um, so this is a slide just to kind of give you an idea of how the SQT and the debit tool output could be used in the context of providing information to us to inform our decisions. Um, so I mean, we hear you know, lots of 
you know, statements like what you see on the screen here that you know, often you know, in the past we have had to sort of you know, qualitatively defend. You know, it might be based on a lot of EPJ, it might be very subjective, not repeatable. You know, it's just a lot of um, potential limitations in defending the, these kinds of statements in the absence of a functional assessment methodology. So um, output from the, the debit calculator and the SQT is, is really going to help you when you're working to support things like this is an awesome restoration project. There's going to be phenomenal lift here. This is going to give us so many credits. You know, this this impact site is really low functioning. You know, it's so degraded. We shouldn't worry too much about it. You know, all of those those sort of conclusion statements can be supported um, by science with the output from the debit and the SQT tools. So mitigation is not required. This is just sort of a, you know, just a reminder. Non-regulated activities, exempt activities, restoration activities, you know, things that um, would fall under National 27, uh, bioengineering of stream banks, you know, all those things. You know, we're not talking about impact. We're not talking about mitigation for those kinds of impacts that either aren't regulated at all by our agency or are solely uh, primarily beneficial in nature. Um, when we talk about stream mitigation um, for stream impacts, you know that we are talking about that in the context of the compensation being in kind to offset stream loss. So, um, you know, if there are stream impacts proposed at a site that can't be avoided, you know what we're going to be working with you to move forward on is stream compensation, you know, um, not not wetland compensation or some other form of aquatic resource compensation. Uh, preference hierarchy, you guys know this too, so I'm not going to say a lot about that. Uh, we know though that you know, since banks are preferred, um, again, like I said, the uh, emerging need for stream credits in the watersheds of, of our states, you know, is really, I hope them start to you know, really take hold and we're going to start to see stream bank proposals. Um, so that, that will really go a long way in helping project proponents be able to satisfy um, requirements because you know, we'd, we'd rather not spend you know a decade or more like we did with wetlands having only PRM on the ground and seeing lots of failure. You know, we expect in all likelihood the same reasons PRM wetland is not preferred will be relevant in the context of stream mitigation. Um, you know, that we're going to have some cases where PRM is going to be the only possibility and we're going to have to do the best we can with it. Um, but you know, we definitely want to work with project proponents, with sponsors, to encourage good stream banks so that um, those can get on the landscape in advance of impacts and help satisfy Clean Water Act requirements. Uh, likely we're going to work with the same BSAs, um, really focusing on strategic selection of sites. Um, you know, we're not looking at, like we do with wetlands. Um, we, you know, we break wetlands out into all the different vegetation types based on eggers and reed. Um, we're not looking at similarly doing any kind of breakout, you know, cold water streams or perennial streams or intermittent streams. And you know, we're not looking to characterize different classes of streams in the, in the crediting context, but rather look for functional gain. And when, we, when, we've, when we're accounting at the impact site for functional loss, and we're accounting at the banks or PRM sites for functional gain. You know that'll be a kind of an apples to apples. And as long as the sites for banks are selected based on needs in the watershed, you know we don't think we need to do a further parsing out of, of classes of types of streams. Um, all these things that are you know, relevant in the context of wetlands. Site protection, maintenance, adaptive management, long-term management, you know, all of that, all the requirements um, in the rule for wetland banks will also be um, relevant to stream banks. Um, I'll, I'll highlight here number five, the credit determination methodology. So for, for your stream banks, the, the methodology will be the SQT. So they, um, the credits will be in the context of functional feet. 
um, rather than linear distance or, or some other measure. Um, and we definitely, um, you know, we, we don't only hope to, but we will learn. <laughs> you know, we're very open-minded and we want to learn everything we possibly can from practitioners, from resource agencies. Um, you know, we know that we don't have all the expertise that we would like to have. Um, again, going back to that recruitment I talked about, where we are looking for someone with stream skills, uh, and we are looking, um, learning from <coughs> other practitioners around the country, and, and looking to learn um, as projects get on the ground. So we ho hopefully have um, a learning curve that we get over more quickly um, with streams than we did with wetlands. Um, you know, thinking back to all those experiences in the 80s and 90s. <laughs> and I'm going to hand it over to Leslie. This doesn't really work, so I'll just set it down. I'm pretty loud. <laughs> Can you guys all hear me? Yep. Okay. All right. Who all went to the November SQT training sessions here? Anybody? A few? Okay. Um, so that was a one-day course, all about the um, functional tool and the SQT. There was actually a full week-long, five-day workshop that I went to one this summer. Um, and one last summer, and Stream Mechanics offers them, so I highly recommend them. Um, this is, he was the contractor, I guess, who worked on developing the tool for us. So I'm going to do what he does in about three minutes. So you can imagine that there's a lot of important details that I'm not going to necessarily like, dive into. Um, originally, it all started, um, Stream Mechanics developed a, the, handbook on the left, which is a function-based framework. And so basically they were trying to look at what are all the functions of the stream, and they put it in a pyramid form with the base being hydrology. So how water gets transported within the watershed to the stream, all the way up to biology, which is very specific to animals and not actually plants the way you think. Um, and so obviously hydrology is the base of the pyramid. It drives everything above it. Um, and so for you to get biology back, you have to have all of the other pyramid bricks underneath it to a certain degree in order to see an improvement. There is a five-day course just on that. So, there you go. Um, so the SQT was kind of like the second part of that. This is the tool to look at, okay, those are the functions in the pyramid. How do we show a change from, if we do a restoration project or we have an impact to a stream, how much loss? What is the change in functions that we are seeing? So the SQT was developed to be a way to actually quantify the change that's happening to the streams based on human activities. So, um, there are some limitations to the SQT. So it, it is for weightable streams. It's not very specifically defined anywhere, but it's not a river. It's not made for ephemeral um, streams. Um, it's not really great at, well, there's, it's not really built into it how to look at wetland and stream complexes, which honestly is the majority of what we have in our whole district, most streams, we don't have our mountain streams like to the extent that they do in Colorado, another state where they have an SQT. Um, so that is one of the limitations, especially in our district, is so that I think Des mentioned, we're looking at how are we gonna deal with all those sites where they have stream and wetland complexes on them. So some strengths of the SQT, it's based on, and the types of data you have to collect, and there is a lot of data you have to collect, but it's all very standardized stream data. So any stream practitioner who does restorations or um, does a lot of, diff of these different measurements is really familiar with all the metrics they have to measure in the field. Um, it is actually a spreadsheet, so in the end you take the data that you collect in the field, you plop it in the spreadsheet, and it, if you fill out the whole spreadsheet, it will spit out some scores for you. So it's actually very user friendly. We are still working on some bugs within the current one. Um, so if you do, if you play around in it, and I think there are links to it on our website too, but it's like a spreadsheet, 
if you feel like it, you're welcome to play around in there. And if you ever run into <coughs> problems in there, just let us know. Um, there should be a point of contact for us for if you run into, you know, it's not giving me an answer. We want to be able to fix all those things. So this is kind of an overlapping slide. Let's skip it. Um, so this slide is just intended to show you what the actual SQT, one of the sheets in the Excel table looks like. Um, so on the left is the functional category. So those are those pyramid blocks. Um, and then it looks at what your function-based parameters are. So within hydrology, you would measure for reach runoff. And then it has a metric for how you would measure those, that um, parameter. The field value is what you collect in the field. And then the index value, it calculates for you using some background reference curve, so using data that we already have. Um, in the end, what it does is give you these present colored categories and tells you whether your site is doing well or not doing well um, in each of those different um, functional categories. So this just kind of gives you a visual of what a stream that is not functioning overall um, and all the way to functioning is. And I think the takeaway is that it's a range. So those numbers up there are the ranges in the SQT. Anywhere from 0 to 0.29 is not functioning. But then from 0.7 to 1 is functioning. So it doesn't have to be the perfect pristine stream to still be considered functionally in high quality. So, so these ones with the stars, those um, function-based parameters with the stars are considered the big four. And so this is going to be really fast, but we have a slide on each of those, just what that is. Um, these are kind of some of the mandatory, if you complete the SQT, you, you have to measure some of them for it to give you an answer. So those are some of those. So floodplain connectivity is what you would think. It's how the, the channel is connected to its floodplain, or is it incised, um, or is it entrenched. So you know maybe your ditches, maybe more of those types of potential tributaries that are not connected to their floodplain. Um, so I think we are going to share this in PowerPoint, correct us? OK, so um, you will have that for reference. So in here, it tells you what the different, for each slide, what type of measurement method you would use. So bed form diversity, you're looking at the structure of the stream and how it moves sediment. You're looking at um, riffle to pool spacing. Can we read all of them? OK, so riparian vegetation is exactly what you think. So within that riparian zone, how is the, how is the vegetation within that riparian, riparian zone? Is it how wide is that riparian zone? Is it established? And that, if you think about a lot of our urban streams, that would be where you would see a lot of functional problems happening as well as because well, there's a lot of encroachment happening. Lateral migration is a fancy word for how stable the stream bank is. So another few measurements. Um, and, I'm, and so for some of these big four, you have to complete all the different measurement methods in the SQT. And for some of them, you don't. The manual goes into more detail about when each of those is the case. So another slide just about what the required parameters and metrics are for restoration projects specifically. Um, Again, to do the full SBT, there are some things that in order for it to give you a score, you have to do certain metrics. You'll notice that the biology and physical chemicals, so those top two blocks, are not mandatory. There might be times when you would want to measure the biology and to do you know, sediment load scores, but um, it's not mandatory. OK, so this is kind of a fun slide. So what the SQT does when you're talking about like a mitigation bank, for example, is you would do run the SQT for the current condition. So you would look at the existing condition. Um, and then you would, based on the design that you do, you would predict your proposed condition. So it, the SQT will give you what the score is for the existing versus proposed. 
you would have to provide the length of the, screen, the stream for both existing and proposed. And the SQT will give you how many functional feet is that when it, in the current condition. So um, your existing condition score times your stream length gives you a functional foot score. So how, how well is that stream functioning? For that linear feet of 185. Not doing so awesome. The proposed condition score does the same thing, gives you a functional foot output. In this case, if your proposed condition score is 448 and your existing is 185, your, the change, the difference between the two is 263 and that is your credits. And that is the way we are looking at it. So as far as the mitigation bank goes, it take, the SQT takes out some of the guesswork for the bank sponsor when you're looking at, you know, a, what will the core agree to? What ratio are they going to buy today? It just tells you based on that change, and that's the number. All right, switching over um, to the impact side of things. So the debit calculator in some districts is part of the whole SQT. It's actually a separate spreadsheet for us. Um, so it does basically the inverse of what the SQT does. It measures, measures your loss or tells you your loss, which could mean it tells you how much mitigation is required. So don't get scared if you fill this out and you come up with a negative number. It is supposed to be like that because it is Again, it's not measuring your gain, your improvement, it's measuring the, how, how much worse functionally is the stream. So Des mentioned the um, severity tiers. There are five. So I'm going to run through a quick example kind of showing you how the debit tool could work. Um, so this example is with Mission Creek. Mission Creek? Mission Creek. Um, it's a project where Say they're looking to channelize 830 linear feet. Um, so what you would do in the severity tiers is you would pick a severity tier based on what type of project you have. You might notice that some of the example activities show up in more than one tier. So the most important thing is actually not to look at the example activities. You can use it as a reference when you're just learning, but um, the most important part is actually to look at um, what function in the pyramid is actually being affected. Um, so I don't actually, okay, we did. Um, so look at the description. So severity tier one, zero, you're not, there's no permanent impact to any of those function-based parameters, so the biology or the hydrology or um, physical chemical. For severity tier one, you're impacting the riparian bench. So maybe cutting trees. <coughs> um, severity tier two, it's riparian bench plus lateral migration and bed form diversity. And it goes on from there. So channelization, we put as severity tier four. And then you have three options for how you're going to calculate your functional loss. Um, so the option one is the most rigorous, I would say, that's where you do the full SQT um, to, to see what the actual loss will be. You measure the different parameters. So that is obviously probably the most expensive and time consuming, but I want to show you why there might be times you might want to do that. Um, I should have noted, it's entirely up to you which of these options you pick. The core is not going to tell you which debit tool option you choose. Um, this is up to you and your, your clients. So debit tool option two is where you choose what parameters when the, within the SQT you want to measure and you use the debit calculator to fill in the rest. Option three is you just use the debit calculator and you, it basically plugs in the standard score that the debit tool establishes which in most parts of the state and for most waters is a 0.8, which is functioning stream. So that would mean you are assuming it is functioning. 
So, all right, so for that channelization project, <coughs> where we are in severity tier four, um, if you plug in that existing condition score of 0.8, and that's what you assume, your functional loss is 524.5 credits. That could be a lot of credits that have to be purchased. Debit tool option two. And I can't honestly remember which, which um, parameters were measured for this example, but it was not all of them. I think it was only one or two. But you can see that just taking the time or the and the cost of measuring a couple of parameters resulted in 439 credits. Debit tool option one, where you do the full SQT, your functional loss is 258. So this slide, just one, just to show you the same project, same impact, using the debit tool in three different ways can give you three different answers, and it's entirely up to you based on how fast you need the permit, how much time and money you have to put into collecting the data. But as you can see, some, to some extent, you have to just kind of weigh whether it's worth the, the time, um, the cost, and really whether you think the stream isn't as functioning as the debit tool or as the SQT would, would tell you. So there are a few spreadsheet quirks. Um, so just one to keep in mind when you're playing with both the debit tool and the SQT, there are some cells that you have to fill out where it won't give you a score. So if you ever get a response false, that means that you probably forgot to fill in just even the description of the area you're in. Because you have to tell the tool something about what region you're in, what type of, of water you're in. Um, or it doesn't know what background data to use to do the calculations. Okay, Catchment assessment tool is one of the sheets within the SQT. And it, it was developed, well, it's used in every SQT tool across the country. Basically, overall, what it does is it looks at what's going on in the watershed and tells you how that might affect your restoration project where you are. So are you in more of an urban setting, or are you in the northeast still on the north shore? So it looks at what the different stressors are. So um, this is kind of a quick screenshot of what it can look like. Um, this is just, so basically the, the catchment assessment tool has different categories. Um, it looks at what different stressors there might be, and you, so let's use the walk. DNR's tool online. So there's a public tool online that we used when developing the SQT with Stream Mechanics and the other agencies who helped. Um, DNR had basically all the stressor data from across the state that we needed. So the data was pulled from that tool and so basically it's kind of, I think it's probably, I'm going to say it's the best one in the country I'm told because you don't have to go digging in lots of different places and, and try to find the data yourself. All you have to do is go to the WAP um, and go to the different sheets that it tells you to. And there is additional information and details about where to get the information um, for each to answer each question. But basically, you go through, you fill out the catchment tool, and you come up with a score of or good or fair. And that will tell you like how is the watershed around you doing and how likely is your um, restoration likely to be successful and sustainable in the long term. And that's one of the ways we plan to use the catchment assessment tool right now, is especially to help us um, assess bank potential. So one of the things we've been telling folks who are out considering whether they want to pursue um, going through the banking process on particular restoration sites is the first thing they should do is look at the catchment assessment form and, and see what that tells them about the watershed that's feeding into that, that stream. Okay. Um, so there are a whole bunch of these tools are all on our website. I don't know how easy that is to see actually now that I think about it, but um, if, if anyone has trouble finding these documents, feel free to email probably Des or I, and we can help you locate them. Um, 
but on our website there is a stream quantification tool link and it'll help you get to the debit calculator, to the catchment tool, and then there's also a whole bunch of background documents. So I think one of the things we're recommending people read first, if, if they want to read one document, because there's so many of them, they're so long, is that function-based framework for my first slide that I talked about, just about like what those pyramid blocks are and what they mean. <clears throat> this is kind of a repeat slide, I guess, again. So. Hopefully in the spring you will be seeing a draft of the procedures, so please do read that and provide comments back and um, help us make the next version better. Another link for, um, okay, so if you want to receive, we've been putting out public notices for those of you who follow our notices, kind of giving updates on what we're doing, and I think we're going to be doing some more in the near future. So if you're interested, there is a link on our website also that you can use to sign up for, for those notices so you're kind of in the know about when to watch for things. I think that still leaves us about 20 minutes for you to ask Joseph and I some questions. Yeah. So I have concerns with using water quality parameters here because in particular dissolved oxygen, TSS, and uh, microinvertebrates. A, because those require sampling, and B, because if you restore a segment of a stream, it's going to have no effect on those parameters. You've still got the upstream dissolved oxygen and all the other um, nasties coming in. So I wonder why is, what's the reasoning for including that in the scoring here when um, it's really not going to have an effect. Yeah, so those things that you're describing would be in the biology and physicochemical. Um, so they are part of the tool because sometimes, in some cases, you might be able to see a change um, from pre and post restoration. It's often very delayed for a couple of years, and it's gonna have a lot to do with what's going on in the upstream and the downstream. So you're right, like you can't just take a segment of, of a ditch and add some meanders and think you're gonna have trout back, that's unlikely. Um, but it, in some cases, you might see that lift. So if you, well, what slide that was? So there, when you do the SQT, you have for like for a mitigation bank, you have to use the SQ the most of the parameters. Let's see, I think they're well. Okay, so let me see if I'm not showing up. Okay, um, so let, let me give you an example yeah. here. So dissolved oxygen will vary in a stream within a 24-hour cycle dramatically. And so again, you're, you're talking about uh, a rigorous type of sampling method that one grab sample is not going to really give you much uh, on, you know, on large, large river hydropower projects and whatnot. They do the sampling year round. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, nobody's maintaining that kind of data on small streams in Minnesota. It's not like the big river systems. Yeah, and so what I was going to add is you don't have to measure those bottom two. So the biology and physical chemicals, so anything about the fish and the microinvertebrates and the temperatures, not required for that reason. But then the other part you got to is you could not probably, to get the, if you wanted to measure them, you wouldn't just be able to take, like you say, a sample a month, a sample a day. It probably would be a pretty rigorous monitoring as well. The, I know there's like a tool like a uh, flux that could be using that some you can grab from that and use that as a apply to <coughs> regarding the you know, TSS. Flux. Yeah, it, it's yeah. it's some it's more for engineers, but they 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 use that to like when they do the TMTLs. You know, the it's, it's it's uh, using estimates. So is it, point, it's, is it like so? It's a type of measurement 
method, or is it just like raw? Is it raw data you're collecting, or is it like you're pulling data from somewhere can you, else? Can you repeat the question too? Oh, so it, it, yeah, there's like I think there's a tool called Flux that can be used to, uh, and it, a lot of times done by you know as part of, uh, and I think that they use a, they assumed or they they calculate based on what inputs you do have, and it does you know we talk about like. Summer or something, it will actually show that dip or you know, or a variation, but it, to the point they don't need to. Yeah, Flux, Flux has baseline parameters already there. Yeah. So, again, it was what I was talking about earlier with large river systems. Somebody's always measuring this data, and then that's what they will use for Flux models. Yeah. So, I'm saying that you could actually take the results of the Flux. Because I think this would yeah. just be a number of zero, a, a strict value. Like you have to just use a number. So you kind of use that judgment and then have other people look at it, I guess, and kind of come up with some. Like for the projected, think you're thinking like for what you can expect, or I, I don't know if I'm obviously not familiar with Flux. Yeah, so. but I think it was, it's an Army Corps tool, I believe. Yeah, yeah. It is. yeah. Okay. Um, and it's, that it applies a little more to like engineering, but. It, 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 uh, to kind of fill in the blanks to everything else that's to keep, you know, just so that the spreadsheet can be you know, looked at or uh, you know, assessed so that you can get from point A to point B. And it's, I mean, you mentioned like, you know, this is a work in progress, but you can rely on something that can, are, that already has kind of been developed to add in and, you know, or, if there's, because it looks like it's just one number you put in per field. I mean, so I, I would, yeah. So what I would suggest is if you have the opportunity to look at the SQT manual that's out there, um, or email me and remind me to look. It, it, so for each of the parameters, it tells you different methods and that you would use. And I, yeah, I, I haven't worked. Yeah, I haven't worked on plus. Familiar with that. So. Then work on budget because I'm going to have to do my own. You know, yeah, speak. Just to, because, yeah, the issue of variable DOs. And, that's, that'd be awesome. that'd be a challenge. Cool. So you said, I think, in one of your first slides, what this tool could and could be used for, like weightable streams. So what is the, what are you supposed to do for streams that don't fall yeah. in the acceptable? Yeah, so that is, I think, I don't even know if we listed that on our list of things we're still trying to work out, but that's actually something we don't have the answer to yet. So streams like the Mississippi, those big actual rivers, you can't use the SQT. It's just not built for it. The reference curves that the data is based on don't include any of that. I think he might be looking at developing a tool for those types of systems, but that's, that's years out. <coughs> Who knows if we would have the funding? So for now, at least, at least it covers the majority of the streams that we do have the, the channels. So it doesn't those very small ephemeral tributaries that are dry most of the year. This is not going to work for either, um, for the same reason. It, the the data is not part of the tool, so that is one of the, one of the caveats. So what to do in those settings? I think for now, would you say is probably case by case, and probably status quo. So you know, when we have large mining projects or other large projects where they're impacting streams, it's not that we're not requiring mitigation for those projects. It's that they don't have any sort of a tool to help them decide what's a, how do, like if they're gonna eliminate this stream and they wanna do a restoration project, how do we know that those are equivalent? And that's kind of what the SQT is intended to help with. Who, who is the author's name? The author's name? Will Harmon um, is the he, he's the lead of Stream Mechanics is the name of the company, and he has a website and he does you know list all his um, workshops that he does in the country. I know he is I think planning to do one in Minnesota or Wisconsin in the next year I think. Yeah, I was just going to say to your question, in the absence of a, an appropriate functional assessment methodology, then we would just fall back on you know, linear distance ratios as a surrogate. So it's, you know, it's not science-based, 
know, so it, it does fall back into more of J, inconsistencies, you know, all those challenges that, that we can address through use of a science tool. So what is the entire spectrum of the kinds of streams that this would apply to? If it doesn't apply to ephemeral streams or it doesn't sound like it applies to agricultural drainage ditches, um, can you, are you going to put parameters on, okay, what kind of water resources this should be used for? Because it sounds like that's really fuzzy. Like, okay, it doesn't apply to the Mississippi, does it apply to the Minnesota? Would it apply to Nine Mile Creek? Would it apply to a drainage ditch with two to one slopes that's 12 feet deep? Yeah. And straight. I'm gonna let us have the jurisdiction talk, but I mean, it, so I think the majority of streams that we have in, in small rivers could use this. It's weightable means you basically can wade across it, so Minnesota probably not either. Um, And then, so I think the first thing you probably have to do, though, is figure out if the water you're working in is, is jurisdictional. Um, right. so some of those. So you mentioned ditches. <coughs> so if it if it's called a ditch, but it's you know historically it was a stream that has been channelized. I'm not asking about jurisdiction. I'm wanting to know like, okay, so if it's a ditch, does this apply? It could. There are a lot of ditches that are jurisdictional. Almost all of them are. And some of them aren't for reasons that are mystical, in my opinion. Um, but I just want to know, so I think there needs to be some guidance with some photographs or dimensions that says this is for these features. Um, because we know the wetland regulations apply to wetlands. Mm -hmm. And we know MinRAM was for wetlands. But I really don't understand yeah, we, we like where yeah, this we, starts and stops. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're talking about perennial streams versus intermittent streams versus ephemeral streams. Um, and that's what other stream assessment methodologies I've worked on always ask for. Is it intermittent? Is it perennial? Is it ephemeral? Those are all different. Well, yeah, and is it meandered or is it completely channelized or is it a man-made or excavated feature that appears to be excavated on upland. Those are really simple yes, no questions. And it's, that would that would eliminate a lot of uncertainty as to when to use this. And then I'd also like to know like, okay, how long did you anticipate the rollout period to take? Like Okay, I get that there's, we're in an experimental phase right now, and some people are already using this voluntarily. Um, do you think you're going to have clarity on all those foggy questions about how this will be implemented in a year or two years? What's your best guess? We, we do expect to have the, the draft procedures, version 1.0, available this spring. Um, we, we are close to wrapping it up internally. We need to coordinate it with the interagency team. You know, when the version 1.0 goes out on public notice, you know, we want to make sure that we're clear in there on things that we are continuing to seek input on. You know, we, we want to be careful that we aren't imposing you know, rigorous requirements if we can't back up those requirements. Um, but we, we also want to be sure that we're imposing requirements that are appropriate based on our statutory obligations and the Clean Water Act mission. So, um, you know, to get to the point of, of what kind of tributary is going to trigger the use, you know, I think some of that is going to be addressed in the Oregon Water Work Program that we're working on with all of these. We actually just talked about this among our team this week. Um, you know, we're working on a form that asks for information about ordinary high water mark characteristics you know, to help explain and provide information on you know, the, the characteristics of the feature that's on the ground. You know, we have information in there that talks about flow rate, flow regime, 
whether the tributary is is a constructed ditch, you know, what is its historical condition. So that kind, the collection of that kind of information will help inform decisions on when the SQT would be applied. And, and we want to be clear in that procedures document that we distribute to the public, you know, based on the, the results of your baseline assessment, what types of tributary impacts might require mitigation and trigger this SQT evaluation. So if I understand you correctly, you're not real, like, if, okay, if, if I have a client right now that wants to fill an agricultural drainage ditch um, and put it in a pipe, um, and it's a channelized ditch surrounded on both sides by farmed upland, and it's dominated by reed canary grass. Do you think this would be a good tool for that, or no? So, I mean, this, this is, I mean, like you said, you, you're not necessarily asking about jurisdiction, and, and you said that these procedures don't change jurisdiction, but you know, it is important you know, kind of to establish a fundamental understanding when we're talking about the project, you know, is, is the feature a tributary or not? You know, some ditches are tributaries. Well, this is jurisdictional because it, it's connected to lakes on both ends. So if, it, if you know, it's very difficult for me to give a definitive answer to a hypothetical scenario, and you know, pretend really it's, it's a real scenario. It, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's also really easy for when it's real hypotheticals and and any like answer that may be taken as definitive from me right now. I just I do worry that it you know could be taken out of context. And okay. So okay. I just you know that's. <laughs> We're happy to talk with you about project specifics. Well, and the only other thing I was going to add is like, so we say perennial intermittent. That doesn't necessarily mean it's not. Even just champing channelized and what everyone calls a ditch can vary person by person a little bit. Just because it is channelized doesn't mean it's not a tributary and you couldn't use this SQT if it's weightable and it's not. And to some extent, I think it, it, maybe at first it would be good for us to just suggest like some initial contacts so we can help you figure it out whether we should apply this for your particular stream or niche um, before you try to figure that out yourself. And, and we do want in the in the procedures document to you know, provide you know, some context and explanation of you know, key differences in resources and you know when you're talking about an area characterized by wetland vegetation you know what, what how does that kind of resource how is that kind of resource addressed in in the context of this requirement so we, we want to provide some of that clarity and your point about making sure that the definite that you know what is weightable mm -hmm. i'm going to i'll take a look back because i think that that's a good point we should make sure that that's there are some parameters on like what are the sideboards? What you know, where where's this end start when we don't use it because it's too big and when is it too small? So yeah, that would we'll tool, what information do we use? What tool do we use then to, to provide the core on what the, the mitigation impacts are as opposed to apply the, the it, Mississippi River, for example. So it, it goes back to kind of the status status quo, what we okay. do. <laughs> I want to, and there's other questions, I know it's a difficult position to be in that you guys are, you know, we're all trying to figure this out right now. I would just, all I would say is take the comments that you received back from this group seriously because I think that we we certainly will be providing some to, to help with the guidance, but um, appreciate you being here today and thank you for all the information. Yeah, thank you guys. Maybe one final question here, Roxy? Yeah, um, for, let's say for a project that has the element or stream impacts that are significant enough to trigger some of this stuff, where do you see this fitting into the current process? Like, would it be something that would be done before an application was submitted, or would it be some feedback from you guys saying this needs to be done? If at this point, I would suggest that you would probably do a like a pre-application context, talk to us about the project area, the baseline of tributaries out there, you know, talk about talk with us about your proposal, um, and then you know 
then we'll decide, like, oh, okay, but these areas here, you should definitely do the SQT, you know, we wouldn't want you to afford that effort and, and incur that cost, you know, it wasn't necessary, but definitely highly encourage pre application. How, how much time do you feel that your, your section will need to contribute to your regulatory project managers to help them with this guidance? Um, just a predictability piece here as we're planning, um, you know, short-term, long-term project work, knowing that there could be effects to work in. What, what, do you, what is your availability? How much time are you going to need to guide your project managers to guide the regulated community? And that's that's a good question. Um, you know, we, we obviously you know we have we can't turn things away, and it's hard for us to predict what's going to come into us. Um, and so I mean I think that that's that's something that over time um, we're we're going to implement efficiency measures. Obviously, you know the the more we see and the better we get at answering questions and providing guidance. You know those efficiencies and time needed from project managers for pro specific projects will reduce. But yeah, I mean it's really hard to predict right now, like how how much time, um, because all that's going to be based on project complexity. We'll, we'll throw some realistic predictions out there. We we live in Minnesota. We know what the legislative rules are related to transportation bonding. We can look at predictability of you know MnDOT projects. We can look at predictability of mine plans of operation for aggregate or hard rock mining. We can look at um, we can look at some predictabilities over the next five years where we might see effects to riparian areas. What are you doing to prepare your team to be prepared with your regulatory project managers to be able to have responses that are timely, that need the seasonality to get this going if you think it's going to be necessary to develop mitigation. I mean, in five years, I can probably give you 100 miles of streams that will probably be affected if we just sit down and look at a map. Yeah, so I think we, we need to work with the public, with these stakeholders who are proposing projects, and, and listen to you. you. You tell us what you're predicting, and that will help inform how we plan and, and staff and resource and prioritize our, our work. Is that we, we, your interagency team right now? We, we don't, I mean, we, we aren't staff, we aren't authorized to do assessments uh, of project forecasting. Like the, the information you're talking about, mm -hmm. where, where you, you could collect information, at, you know, and, and forecast five, ten years in the future on DOT projects, on mining projects. I mean, that, that's not work that we undertake. That's that's we don't have we're not authorized to do that kind of forecasting but if you provide as the project proponent the project sponsors the affected stakeholders you provide information to us on what you may expect to be proposing and presenting to us we can use that information to develop our program priorities to decide where do we put our resources for the most effective program implementation so is the interagency work helping to inform you in that way? In, in any of those, is the interagency work that you're doing in Minnesota, Wisconsin, helping to inform you um, how to predict the workload or the level of effort that you'll need to be providing you? So, so that our inter maybe I'm misunderstanding your question. So the, the work yep. that we're doing with the interagency team, they have helped inform the the SQT. They helped provide technical input on development of the tool that allows for the assessment of functional loss and functional lift. They are providing input to us on how we will use those tools in the context of our program. Good luck. <laughs> I think, I think it needs it needs some you need some interagency stakeholder work to see how to apply this if it's going to be necessary as a regulatory um, parameter for applicants to deal with these potential losses and it, it's really unpredictable for the regulated public to know how to proceed um, in engaging them on the topic. It, it's very interesting and it seems it's necessary. Those are really important resources. So I'm not taking mm -hmm. any of that. But it seems like there's uh, there's some missing pieces in here of 
predictability for implementation, predictability. I mean, for I, I think a lot of what I mean, from my perspective, a lot of what you're getting at in terms of impacts and need for compensation, you know, is very relevant in context of defending an emerging market for bank credits. So when project proponents, when when whoever is, is proposing projects, you know, they are going to be responsible for complying with the Clean Water Act. And the, the easiest way for a permittee to comply with the Clean Water Act is to buy bank credits, you know, whether that's wetland or stream. And if they're impacting streams, they need stream compensation. And so that the project proponents that are forecasting their impacts and watersheds, you know, can, should, can, I would highly encourage them to talk to bankers about proposing good banks in strategically selected locations where they get credits on the ground that then those project proponents can purchase. I mean, what I'd like to see, I've been working in, I've been working in this district for 25 years now, and um, it, it, there's always a backlog. Things never get done in a timely manner. We have to beg for our permits. I think what Liz has here is the same skepticism that we all have, and that you'll be able to um, effectively and timely um, implement this program. Because over the last 25 years, I haven't seen any evidence, quite frankly. And I'm, I'm as a consequence, I'm a big advocate for state assumption of 404, uh, just because I'm frustrated with this district uh, in, in being responsive, timely, and um, sensible in many in many uh, interactions. So there's a great amount of skepticism in this group. We've all been working with this core district for decades, and uh, I think this is a great program. But um, you got a lot more work to do. You know, it's uh, and you, you have a lot of work to do to convince us that you're going to effectively um, um, and timely in a timely manner. Um, roll this out, implement it, and enforce it. Yeah. And many years ago, there was the Northeast Minnesota Mitigation Strategy. I know a number of people in this room have either used it or referenced it. It helped to set the course where there could be projected need for wetland credits, similar to that. So looking across our landscape, where it, whether it's a, a mining-sensitive landscape or whether it's an agrarian-sensitive landscape, I think there's, there's a way to start doing that predictive assessment of where we're going to have needs to your point about strategic placement of mitigation sites so similar to that stakeholder effort that went into the northeastern minnesota mitigation strategy what is the stream mitigation strategy for the st paul district and how does that um, encompass um, you know our neighbors to the east of wisconsin that are regulated by the, by the district but also the other program programs in minnesota so that we as the regulated public can also provide that information about where should we be focusing reasonable um, reasonable efforts that have you know, have mitigation effect that's positive versus the postage stamp mitigation to like okay I got my three feet that I needed and I can move on with my project so so again that's what I'm getting I'm like where's the predictability of when this is going to be implemented when we the regulated public need to be ready to do it that. If I need to build a project, whether it's for a MnDOT or a mine or it's a pipeline or you know the you know the community of East Bug Tussle that needs a new water plant, how much how am I going to do this? Because it's important that we're not affecting stream resources in a way that's you know incompatible with their longevity or long-term perpetuity. So that's what I'm saying. Where is the where is the trajectory here to get some predictability for all of us to know so, what this is going to So be when you when you say predictability, do you mean when can we tell you, for all these kinds of projects, all the time, you're always going to have to require mitigation? Is that the, is, the, is that, the, that, that's part of it, but, but also, when am I going to need it? Because I, I mean, if I'm doing um, comprehensive planning and scoping for my municipality I'm working for, and I, and I have this many projects in these five years, I need to have some predictability of, of when I'm going to have a well impact to plan for the cost and the permitting and the time, but also we need to have some predictability if there's going to be a riparian effect. And all of a sudden, I'm starting to go, well, now I need to add in linear feet of stream as a resource. But 
there's no program to do this, but I know there's this tool and it's a guessing game. So, so, so I mean, look, like we had on one of the slides and we've set this on a public notice, mm -hmm. you know, any impacts over 300 feet, that's kind of where we're starting to have mm -hmm. those conversations. You know, and, and we're not wholesale saying always every impact in excess of 300 feet will always require compensation. <laughs> that's, we're not saying that right now mm -hmm. because we don't feel like we have information to sufficiently support that requirement. But we are having those conversations. So, I mean, the, so generally the guidance is if you know at this time you have projects where there will be more than 300 feet of, of stream impacts, then start thinking about compensation. So, I mean, that's, you know, we, we, we think it's, we, the reason we want to phase this and have a phased implementation approach is so that we can learn from the people who are on the ground, from the people who are doing the work, so that, you know, we're not imposing brand new requirements that are completely different than what you have been used to. Um, you know, we've, based on the Clean Water Act mission, based on our responsibilities, the mitigation rule, the 441 guidelines, we, we believe that requiring compensation for stream impacts is very well founded you know, in, our, in our authorities. But we don't want to just flip a switch and say, hey, you have to do mitigation every time for all these impacts, no questions asked. Like this, the, the concept of phasing is, we're, we're, we're doing it, we think that we're doing it from a perspective of you know, providing, you know, a kind of a slow wade <laughs> into these requirements. Um, but, you know, I, I get what you're saying about predictability, forecasting, you know, you need to know as a project proponent how much you may have to compensate for. And so, I mean, I, I hope that general kind of rule of thumb, 300 feet, you know, start all projects that have more than that impacting to streams, you, know, you do need to start thinking about compensation. and. You know, like I said earlier, if there's not banks, if, you, if there's not an opportunity to purchase credits, then you are looking at PRM, and then that gets to your point, and we don't want a bunch of postage stamps. I mean, we just, we don't. We know that's not successful. But, so again, that gets back to the emerging market of stream credits, and the need for good stream banks, where sites have been strategically selected based on needs of the watershed, and implemented in a way that provides functional improvements. All right, one final quick comment from Rob here, and then we should think, wrap things up. I think this is a really good question, but, but the whole thing about uncertainty and predictability, I don't think it's the Corps of Engineers' job to provide that kind of predictability. I mean, that I, I think we look for some predictability, but we're never going to have the predictability of, like, a stream mitigation strategy. Um, that to me sounds like that, that's the job of the applicant and for instance MnDOT as one of the biggest developers in the state could do that because MnDOT knows how many road improvements might occur in the next 15 years. Um, but that's, so I, I just wanted to put that out there that you know, I like to ask tough questions. I know you guys aren't empowered to make the kind of decisions that are necessary to answer the questions asked. Thank you. That's well, a good point, Rob. That is, um, because MnDA did the MN model for archaeological resources, what, 30 years ago? Yeah. And everybody used it. And MnDA was involved in developing MinRAM, mm -hmm. and before that, WEM. Yeah. And wet. Absolutely. Well, why don't we uh, give Desiree and Leslie a <laughs>